Thank you for joining us today for the Career Speaker Series. This series brings to you the nation's top career authors who provide tips, tools, and best practices you can use to create a successful career strategy. Hey, my name is Brian Lubick, and I'll be your host today. And with me today is Simon Gray, experienced recruiter, chartered accountant, owner of Career Codex, and author of Super Secrets of Successful Executive Job Search. And in the next hour, you're going to learn how to prepare your job search. Now, be sure to have your pen, paper, or electronic device ready to take notes. And hey, check out the download option to gain access to resources that are going to help you use Simon's ideas as you learn how to prepare your job search. And ask questions. Be sure to ask questions. You can submit your questions by clicking on the menu right there in front of you. Share your questions when you think about them so I can share them with Simon. And I want to remind you that this webinar is all about Y-O-U. You are invited to help influence this program by offering your thoughts on how we can continue to be a support to your career. Just click on the menu option that says, give us your feedback. Now, keep in mind, you can fill the frame of the computer with the presentation by clicking on the crossed arrows right there on the bottom of the slide. And when you want to ask a question, just hit your escape key. Now, I'd like to share a little bit of background about our accomplished speaker today. Simon Gray is an experienced recruiter, chartered accountant, and entrepreneur. As a consultant and then founding director of his own recruitment business, he has extensive experience on the front line, acting for both the job seeker and the employer. After many years in the recruitment industry, he realized that the best way to help job seekers at any level was not to find them a position himself, but to empower them to find the right opportunity for themselves. This led to the publication of his first book, Super Secrets of the Successful Job Seeker, and the formation of Career Codex, a careers and employability training company. Since then, he's written two more books, Super Secrets of Successful Executive Job Search and Super Secrets of the Successful First-Time Job Seeker. Simon is an experienced speaker and commentator, he has appeared on BBC National News at 10 and has been quoted in The Guardian, Financial Times, and The Wall Street Journal. He's a past president of the Nottingham, Derby, and Lincoln Society of Chartered Accountants and a freeman of the City of London Merchant Taylor's Company. In his leisure time, Simon is a keen martial artist, and while living and working in Japan, he completed the world-famous Yoshinkan Aikido Senshusei course with the Tokyo Riot Police. How amazing that experience must have been. Simon can be contacted through his website, careercodex.com. On Twitter, his handle is at careercodex, or through LinkedIn. He's always happy to hear from people who have read his book. Today, Simon is going to be your private consultant and share with you his philosophies and ideas from his book, Super Secrets of Successful Executive Job Search. Please join me in welcoming Simon Gray. Thank you very much, Brian. That was a fantastic introduction uh, and uh, very good to be here. I'm not sure whether to say this afternoon or this evening uh, because you'll probably detect my uh, British accent. It's one o'clock here in the morning, but uh, I'm dialed in. I've got the coffee next to me and uh, I've got a lot to share with you on this, uh, on this session. And um, I just wanted to let you know that wherever you're signed in from, uh, in the world, what I'm about to share with you is relevant because in any job search, there are people on both sides of the transaction. And uh, what I found from my coaching of executives from across the world is that people don't tend to change. Yes, cultures are different. Um, there are slight nuances in any particular sector uh, or country, but uh, with people on both sides of the transaction, that's really what successful job search is all about. And uh, in the title of my presentation, you'll see that I have executive in brackets because I know there are people on this webinar uh, of all levels. I tend to spend most of my time coaching executives. But if you're just starting out, same message, same advice that I would give you. If you're mid-career, uh, same message, same advice that I would give you. And it, uh, it boils back to this thing that I talked about uh, just now, that uh, successful job search really is about people and people don't tend to change. So what am I going to cover on this webinar? Well, I'm going to cover four things and time is short. and There's a lot to get through, so uh, I'll do my best. 
Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the four pillars of successful job search. I'm going to talk about how the job market really works and uh, reveal something I call the hidden market. I want to show you how to take proactive control of your career and your future. And uh, I'm going to show you also how to position yourself to stand out and get hired. Because uh, when people think about what the best advice is in the job market at whatever level, you hear this advice all the time. It's, well, you need to stand out. But, uh, you know, how do you do that? Well, I'll share some secrets with you as to how, as to how uh, you actually do that on this webinar. And uh, as Brian's mentioned already, um, there'll be some time for Q&A. I love questions best part of the webinar for me always because I get your feedback, your questions, I get to know what it is you want to know. So uh, please fire those questions. What I prefer to do is to do with those questions at the end, get through the content um, and uh, yes, we'll deal with those at the end and uh, Brian's promised to, uh, to feed those across to me, which is, uh, which is great. So first of all, a question for you and uh, it's an important question because you've signed up for this webinar for a reason. Uh, and that reason is probably something to do with job search or career advancement or career change. And uh, you might be here because you're in search of a job within your current discipline or sector. It could be a career change into a new discipline or sector. Uh, people call this career transition. Uh, it can be more difficult than moving within discipline or sector, but it is possible. Uh, and then, of course, there's career advancement because within your current organization, using some of the strategies and techniques and advice that I give you, uh, particularly if you're in a large organization when you don't necessarily know all of the decision makers above you, um, this methodology can be used for career advancement internally. Now, uh, Brian did a great job of introducing me. Uh, you can see the three books that I've written uh, on the screen there. They are available on Amazon worldwide. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, they're all five-star reviewed or, or pretty much five-star reviewed. And uh, I've helped people from across the world uh, define, find and secure the position they really want not just the one they've seen advertised or necessarily had presented to them by a recruitment company. And uh, that's where my journey really started. I trained in accountancy. I then fell into the recruitment industry and I spent uh, 10 years of my life first as a recruitment consultant. And then I started my own recruitment business back in September 2008. And uh, what I realized is that um, by being in the recruitment sector, I had a lot of experience and advice that I could share. But being a professional recruiter, my job was to place people in jobs. And what that meant is if somebody walked through my office door uh, and I couldn't immediately place them in a role, I didn't necessarily have the time uh, to dedicate to that person, to offer them advice that would help them charter their own ship and find the position for themselves. So um, in, uh, in October 2013, I took a uh, quite a, a radical decision. People thought I was mad. I'd started my recruitment business at, uh, at the bottom of the market as the financial crisis hit and kind of left it when the market was just coming back and uh, was earning decent money, uh, had a very good life. But I wasn't fulfilled and my passion was that I wanted to help the candidates and I wanted to show the candidate, the job seeker, how to do things for themselves. So a lot of what I teach is to show you how to act like a recruiter with one very big difference or a couple of very big differences uh, that I'll come on to as we get through the presentation. Uh, I spent some time in Japan. I do martial arts uh, and I've um, been doing that this evening actually before I got on this call. Um, and um, I bring some of the things that I've learned in the martial arts world to uh, the methodology I've developed um, because in martial arts, it's all about discipline. Uh, and discipline is one of the key ingredients of successful job search. So there are a number of challenges in the job markets, and uh, this is wherever you're based or whatever your level. And uh, what you'll find is, and you may have experienced some of this already, that uh, as you advance in your career, as you get higher up in an organization, uh, there are narrowing opportunities. There are less people at the top of an organization, less people further on uh, in their careers at the top of an organization. What that means, particularly at the executive level, is that opportunities are fiercely contested. The big mistake people make is they spend too much time on their CV or resume. And uh, if you think about standing out, well, what is standing out? Well, it's doing different things to everybody else. And the majority of people, when they come to the job market, the first thing they think about doing is putting a CV or resume together. And it's a big mistake. And then they rely on their CV or resume to open doors, um, usually to advertised opportunities, uh, and wonder then why they're not achieving the success that they deserve. Um, doing what everyone else is doing makes it difficult to stand out. I mentioned that already. And the methodology that I advocate, which is standing out, means that you have to step out of your comfort zone. And that has a psychological impact because we all like to, um, you know, we all like to be comfortable. 
and some of the things I talk about doing, they get great results, but it means you have to step out of your comfort zone. And the magic in life, whether it's in job search, personal life, professional life, uh, for me has always been when I've got slightly uncomfortable and got on the periphery of the comfort, comfort zone, stepped out of it for long enough to make that comfort zone grow. That's really where the magic happens. Um, the other thing people do is they don't plan. So they, uh, they come onto the job market, um, they react to what they see out there, and uh, their success is left to chance. And uh, time is an important factor. And if you've been on the job market for a little while uh, and have not secured a position that you want, um, you're probably a very different person to the, uh, the person you were on day one because the job market is fraught with rejection. And how you handle that rejection um, and how you handle that rejection over time and how you choose to turn up and play the game or whether you give up and go and do something else, um, that really has a massive, massive impact on your uh, on your results. Because I'm a big believer that if you uh, if you play the game properly, and I'll show you some of that uh, on the webinar, um, it's only a matter of time. Uh, if you keep knocking on the door of success, that door's going to open at some point. Uh, and uh, time is an important uh, factor on your psychology, which is the key determinant, in my opinion, uh, of success or failure in the job market. So have a think about where you are now in terms of your job search. Uh, there are two real extremes here. There's what I call reactive chaos, and then there's proactive control. And uh, when I run my own webinars, uh, and people are engaging with my content for the first time, most people are in this state of reactive chaos. What I mean by that is that I have a plan. They don't really know where they're headed. They've not defined what it is they want. And their whole job search is at the, uh, the beck and call of third parties, uh, recruiters, job boards, uh, and they're reacting to what they see out there. Uh, and that can be very, very disempowering very, very quickly. Um, what if you go and see a uh, recruiter or apply to a job online and you don't hear back? What do you do next? Well, you're not in control. Do you wait for the phone to ring? Um, do you wait for that email to pop up? Um, it's reactive chaos and it's not very empowering. So what I advocate, what I'm going to talk to you about, is about taking proactive control. Because when you understand what's important for successful job search and you understand what you do, how you do it and how to get better doing it over time, you're in control of your process, you're in control of your future. So the methodology I developed from 10 years in the recruitment industry and five years uh, now running career codex and coaching people from all over the world um, is four stages. Yeah, there are four pillars of success and where most people start is over at the right and this is the process. So in the process section, um, what I tend to talk about, we start with a CV or resume, cover letters, getting in front of decision makers. I'll summarize that towards the end of the webinar. Uh, and I've already said that, that the CV or resume is not the best place to start. So what I advocate doing is taking three steps back to first consider the environment. So this is the external environment to you and how the job market really works. And if you understand how the job market really works, this is where you can unlock the hidden market, which is opportunities or which are opportunities that are never advertised on job boards or positioned with recruitment companies. So environment is the external environment to you. Psychology then is your internal uh, mental state in how you approach the job market. So while environment is external, psychology is internal. And this is the thing that most people miss. They never really consider what's going on inside their head, what beliefs, what perceptions, what thoughts they're bringing to bear on the market and how that may be impacting their uh, ability to gain, uh, to gain results. So psychology is about uh, challenging beliefs, uh, influencing thoughts through new beliefs, new empowered beliefs, and then driving consistent action over time. And environmental psychology combined to form what I call the foundations of successful job search. Then it's on to planning, because until you decide where you're headed, then it's very difficult to get there. You know, if you, if you jump in the car at the, uh, the weekend uh, and uh, just start driving, well, you may or may end up somewhere that you expected to end up, particularly if you're going somewhere new that you've never been before. Um, but planning is about setting your sat-nav your destination of travel, the position that you want. I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through. Uh, and then it's about working your plan. So your focus in the job market, and this may sound strange, but your focus in the job market, and this is what helps you with your uh, psychology and your consistency in taking action over time, is not actually to find the job. It's to run your process. It's to run your plan. And trust in the fact that if you do that consistently over time, it, it will yield the results that, uh, that you want. So what I wanted to do now is to dive into environment, which is the first level of, um, first level of the, uh, the four pillars, the first pillar 
uh, in the Career Codex methodology. It's the first part of foundations. And it's the first thing that I talk to people about uh, when I engage them on a one-to-one -one basis or through my online coaching programs. And um, the first thing to understand is how employers make recruitment decisions. And employers make recruitment decisions by having three conversations. And they don't immediately go out to job boards, they don't immediately go out to recruitment companies, and they don't do this for, for a few reasons. The first reason is that um, there, is, uh, there is a cost involved. You know, they've got to pay to advertise, they've got to pay a recruitment fee. Um, there is massive uncertainty. You know, if they are um, recruiting people that have, have come through a, an, an online application or through the recommendation of a recruiter, although the recruiter may have a track record there, they're not really known to the employer. So, um, you know, recruitment for an employer is massively uncertain and it's painful um, because it generally takes time. It's painful because they're distracted from doing what they want to be doing, which is running their business. Um, so this all factors into the fact that, that employers don't really like recruiting. And uh, I've recruited for employers from all over the place and uh, over a long period of time. And I don't think I've ever met an employer um, who uh, actually enjoys the process of, uh, of recruiting. Um, so it's a painful experience for them. So your job is to understand that and your job to find success as a starting point is to understand the three conversations employers have. So the first conversations employers have when they're looking to recruit is with their immediate peer group. And they will ask the question, well, who do you know, who do you know, who do you know that could be right for my business? If they get nowhere then, they go out to their extended network. This could be their professional advisors, some of their contacts on LinkedIn who they don't know so well. Um, and they ask the question again, who do you know, who do you know, who do you know? It's only then do they go out to recruiters and job boards. Now, there are some exceptions to the rules. You know, certain organizations uh, will have to go out to the external market and advertise for, for you know, a number of different reasons in terms of, you know, rules and regulations and this, that and the other. But generally, um, organizations, even if they are going out to recruiters uh, at the outset, will still be doing conversations one and two. Uh, and a, a large number of organizations, particularly in the small, medium enterprise space, will be having conversations one and two. So what that means is while the majority of people, while the majority of people are maybe just sending their CV off to recruiters and online job boards, they are missing out on tapping into conversations one and two where they could get recommended. And if they get recommended, what that means is that there's an implicit recommendation, there's more trust involved there because they've been recommended to the employer by somebody, and there's a higher probability of success. What it also does is it allows people to get what I call ahead of the market. So conversations one and two um, exist to the left of the green star on the screen. Okay, so conversations one and two, employers are having discussions at board level, um, they're tapping into their, their um, contact base and they're trying to see if they can find somebody without necessarily going out to the public domain um, to advertise or to place their vacancies with recruiters. So to the left of the green star and the vertical uh, grey line, this is the place I call the hidden markets. And the hidden market is the place where high probability opportunities always exist. Okay, And they're high probability because not everybody else knows about them. Okay, not everybody else knows about them yet, which means if you're positioning yourself there, you have the opportunity to uh, uncover and uh, sometimes even create opportunities from scratch. So where opportunities didn't even exist in the mind of the employer. Now, that may sound uh, a bridge too far at the moment, but uh, I'll share with you a story as we go through uh, of a gentleman from the US that I helped uh, a little while ago who did exactly that. And uh, the, yellow, uh, the yellow arrow there depicts the fact that if you get in early enough, even if the, re the employer is not recruiting at the time, um, you, you have an opportunity to make yourself memorable. And if your positioning is such uh, and your value proposition is such, they may just create that opportunity for you. Uh, and in actual fact, and again, this may sound slightly strange, any approach in the hidden market to an employer in the first instance should never be about your need for a job. That's what everybody else is doing. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we uh, as we go through. So let me talk a bit more about the hidden market. and Let me reveal what the hidden market really is. And your view of the job market at the moment might be the circle on the left. You can see lots of visible opportunities and you're applying for those opportunities, uh, but you may not be hearing back. And you may not be hearing back because there'll be other people with similar skills and experience probably applying. 
Even if your skills and experience are the best for that position, there is a probability that the employer or the recruiter uh, representing uh, will not uh, will not select you for the shortlist. They may miss your application because there's so many, many other people in the game. On the right-hand side is a different contention, and this is the hidden market. And this is where high probability opportunities always exist. Now, over to the left here, seeing is believing. So people see opportunities out there advertised and believe they have a probability of getting them. In fact, it's a very low probability. On the right, it's very different because believing is seeing. Because the hidden market, by its very title, you don't necessarily see those opportunities. They don't necessarily currently exist in the mind of the employer. You may need to create them. And what that means is you have to step out of your comfort zone. And that's what CZ is in that, uh, in that central circle. Once you step out of your comfort zone to do different things because you believe in the hidden market and you take action in the hidden market, you will start to see opportunities others miss. So to jump back to conversations one, two and three that I talked about earlier, over to the left in the big circle, uh, the red dots, conversation three, job boards, recruiters. To the right, uh, it's conversations one and two. This is tapping into the hidden market. And you'll notice the right circle is smaller because the more targeted you can be in what you define the job market to be for you, the higher probability of success. You know, spreading yourself too thin, considering too many opportunities, um, this comes down to poor planning. The more focused you are in what you want, the more chance you have of finding it because you're looking for it actively and the message you put into the market will speak into the uh, decision makers in the right way that will resonate with them so you'll get their attention. So coming back to the methodology that I talk about, if you look at the, uh, the, the left-hand side, you've got the four pillars of success, environment, psychology, planning, and process, uh, which uh, environment and psychology form the foundations. But then in terms of the activity, it's define, which is planning, find, which is planning again, because you have to plan who you're going to approach, and then it's securing, it's running a process better than anyone else. And um, you know, you'll still go through the same recruitment process, but how you play the game and whether you're, you're in control of that recruitment process um, is, uh, is a, a different matter altogether. And uh, the interview environment is, is the example I tend to use here. You know, in the interview environment, your belief may be that you go in there and you're, you're asked a series of question, questions. It's a barrage of questions. But it's not necessarily the case because you're not in control in that situation. I have strategies that I teach people that when they go to the interview, they're in control. And if they're in control, it helps the employer, the interviewer, feel more comfortable in their presence. And influence what I call gut feel. Um, and um, you know, I'm not going to get too much into detail on this on this webinar. But uh, when it comes to making hiring decisions post-interview, um, employers tend to make their hiring decision on one thing and one thing alone. And that is gut feel gut feel, their experience, the experience they've had with the candidate. And I know this because I've taken feedback uh, for over 10 years in the job market. And um, I would say probably 90% of the time when an employer fielded an offer to me to pass on to a candidate, they couldn't specifically articulate why that candidate. It came down to gut feel. It came down to their experience. There was something about that person. That's what gut feel is. OK, so let's talk a little bit about planning. And this is the define element of the methodology I talk about. And I want to ask you a question, and it's an important question. And it's maybe something you've never considered before. But when you look into the job markets, and when you plan where you're headed, are you thinking about A, or are you thinking about B? And A is when you look into the job markets, this is when you're trying to fit in with opportunities that you can visibly see out there. And this is when the conversation starts, well, I need to fit my CV to this particular employer and this, that, and the other. So what are you trying to fit in? Okay, I've already said that fitting in doesn't work. You've got to stand out. Or are you going down the route of B where you're saying, well, it's irrelevant what's out there in the job markets. It's irrelevant what's advertised because I'm going to play in the hidden market anyway. And are you saying, well, okay, let me ask myself a question. What am I passionate about? Because I know if I'm passionate, I'll drive energy into my passion and that will come across to an employer. What type of organization do I want to work for? What type of role in that organization do I want? And where is this organization going to be based? And thinking in, a, thinking in the mindset of B, you know, this, is where you, this is what's exciting about job search. This is where you start to take proactive control. 
because your destination of travel is no longer determined by what you can visibly see out there. It's determined by what you want. So in actual fact, and this again may sound strange, there's a lot of stuff I'm communicating on this webinar that, that, that maybe will make you think in a very, very different way. Um, this may be the first time you've heard stuff like this. But um, going into the job market and positioning yourself uh, in front of an employer, the best time to do that is when they're not advertising, when they're not recruiting. And it doesn't matter whether you uh, position your destination where you're headed um, into, a, it doesn't matter whether you position that um, into, a, into a, a, a market that doesn't currently have that opportunity because you have the opportunity to create and uncover that opportunity in the hidden market. Okay, so I'm talking a little bit about find now and about your positioning. And I spend a lot of my time, both in my own business uh, and coaching people on marketing. Uh, I had to get very good at marketing when I started a recruitment business in the recession um, because you had to stand out or you would make no money at all. So uh, I spent a lot of time, a lot of years um, looking at marketing and thinking about marketing and applying that to the job market. And if you think about marketing and think about marketing um, that's all around you because it's everywhere now, there are really two types of marketing. There's outbound marketing and inbound marketing depicted by the planes on the, uh, on the screen. Think about traditional TV advertising. Okay, this is outbound, outbound marketing. You know, they advertise to a wide audience. Yeah, they push this in front of you. Um, and, um, you know, you may or may not respond. You, it tends to get lost in the noise. Um, there's so much noise out there. People are pushing advertisements in front of us all the time. And we don't generally tend to respond because we become conditioned to switch off. Now, the analogy here in the, uh, in the job market is this is when you send your CV or resume out. You put it out as far and wide as possible in the belief that that's going to get you a new position. You know, that's pushing noise out into the marketplaces along with everybody else's noise and it's never ever standing out, okay? But if you think about inbound marketing, now what's inbound marketing? Inbound marketing is where, um, and I talk about the general marketplace at the moment, it's where brands, it's where organizations are not simply advertising anymore, but what they're doing is they're educating so they're educating their prospects because, you know, the top brands in this world now know that if they educate their prospects, they're not selling to them initially, if they educate them, then they're going to build a relationship with them. OK, they're going to build trust over time. And when it when it becomes time for, for their prospect to buy or transact, who are they going to go to? They're going to go to the person that's helped them. They're going to go to the person or the organization that they trust. So inbound marketing really is all about um, creating content um, to help uh, to help people make future purchase decisions. So what does that mean in the job market? What it means is this: once you know where you're headed, once you know your destination of travel, you know the type of organisation you're looking to work for. Once you research that organisation, you start to uncover some of the challenges, some of the opportunities. Uh, the challenges they're looking to alleviate, the opportunities they're looking to exploit. That's how, that's why people make recruitment decisions. You also understand the wider marketplace, you know, the sector. This is often something that people forget to research. Once you understand the wider sector, again, you understand some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. What that means is that you start to create content and create messaging that isn't about your need for a job. It isn't about your CV or resume. And you start to, you start to create dialogue with employers on that basis, and I'll share an example uh, example with you uh, uh, as we uh, as we move forward. So, getting in front of decision makers and getting hired is not really about sending your CV and resume um, because everyone else is doing that. And if you do that, you're just going to wait. It's going to fade into the noise, and you're not going to get a result. Or you might get a result, but it's left to chance. What it really is about, in terms of getting in, in front of decision makers, is to understand the psychology of those decision makers. So I talked about your psychology at the start, but psychology in the career codex methodology is also about the psychology of the people you're trying to reach. If you can speak into their challenges, if you can speak into their opportunities, you will get an audience with them. And you'll get an audience with them earlier than everybody else, which puts you in pole position to uncover or potentially create opportunities others miss in conversations one and two in the hidden market. OK, LinkedIn. I imagine quite a few of you are on LinkedIn. If you're not on LinkedIn, whatever level you're at, you should get on 
LinkedIn because LinkedIn is the database now. LinkedIn has changed the recruitment game completely. And LinkedIn is a, is a, um, is a way for you to communicate your personal brand uh, to the marketplace. You don't necessarily need a website. You can do this through LinkedIn. And what I was finding that I was doing when I left the recruitment industry about five years ago, is that um, I would um, I would get the CVs from people. Um, that was the you know still is the traditional CV resume, still the traditional way that people apply for positions. Uh, not necessarily the right way, but there we go. Um, and what I would do is cross reference to LinkedIn because LinkedIn tells me a lot more about the person that I'm interested in talking to. Uh, there's recommendations on there. There's skills and endorsements on there. Um, there are a lot more bells and whistles on there that you can include that give the viewer of your profile um, a better understanding of who you are, um, what you're all about, and why they should potentially engage you in conversation. So having a LinkedIn profile is absolutely essential. Now think about how the, uh, the recruitment world works, because the game has completely changed, and it's one of the reasons I decided to get out of recruitment. The primary reason was to help candidates, job seekers, and share that knowledge. But also the writing is kind of on the wall because recruiters used to survive on the basis or used to have a value proposition on the basis um, that they had a database of people and that database wasn't available elsewhere. But what LinkedIn has done has brought job seekers closer to employers. So employers now are using LinkedIn to go directly to the market, directly to candidates but also in reverse, job seekers, if you know what you're doing, you can directly approach employers in the place I call the hidden market. So if you know what you're doing on LinkedIn and you have a strategy on LinkedIn, first of all, you have an optimized profile, uh, what I call a shop window, uh, which is positioned for your target organization decision maker that you're trying to reach. And then you have a proactive engagement strategy. So you use it as a proactive engagement tool you put yourself in much closer proximity to employers. So you don't necessarily need the job boards. You don't necessarily need the recruiters. And think about who is behind a advertised job. Who is behind a recruiter? Well, it's the employer. So wouldn't it be better to go to the employer directly instead? Wouldn't you get a better response and make life easier for the employer? So um, on LinkedIn as well, you know, recruiters now are using LinkedIn as their database. So you have to be on LinkedIn to be found by recruiters. So LinkedIn is the database of choice and LinkedIn is the database because the onus to keep the information up to date is on the individual. The problem with a recruitment database, yeah, the problem with an employer's database, if they have a log of candidates that they've met in the past, is that that information is always going to be out of date. But LinkedIn is always up to date, which is why it's the first point of call when people are looking to, uh, to hire talent for their organizations. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the hire cycle. Now, the hire cycle works both in the face-to-face -face world, so the, uh, you know, the offline world, if you like. It also works in the online world. And it goes back to uh, the, the slide where I was talking about marketing. Because what most people do in the job market, let me just explain what these, what these um, images mean. So we go top left, see me, top right, like me. Bottom left, trust me. Bottom right, hire me. So see me, like me, trust me, hire me. Now, when it comes to branding um, out there in the marketplace now and some of the big consumer brands that we know, what they're all doing is, well, you know, you, you've got to be aware of me. You've got to see what I'm doing, but you've got to like, you've got to have an affinity with my brand. You've got to trust my brand. You know, in the airline industry, you've got to trust who you're going to fly with. Um, and uh, then you're going to buy my products. So they're in the, um, in the real world there. In terms of products and services, um, you'll uh, either per you'll purchase the product or hire the person that you trust. Now, in the job market, it's exactly the same. And what you'll find is that the majority of people, and again, remember, standing out is, by, is about being the minority. It's not about blending in with everybody else. What the majority of people are doing is saying, ah, okay, here's my CV um, or resume. Um, so here it is. Uh, see me. Um, I'm looking for a job, so see me, hire me, please. Uh, see me hire me recruiter, see me hire me uh, employer, um, here's my CV, uh, here's my resume, uh, hire me please. That's what everyone else is doing. It's too quick. It's not the way the world works anymore in terms of marketing. You will be drowned out by all the noise of everybody else doing that. So there is a probability attached to you being drowned out and it's quite a high probability. 
Uh, and if you've applied for online positions and not heard back, you've, um, you've registered with recruiters and not heard back, this really is what I'm talking about. So what I'm suggesting here is that you lengthen the cycle. And we take a lesson from the big brands out there to say, well, okay, here I am. I'm not putting myself up putting myself out there solely as looking for a job, of course I am, but uh, I want you to like me in the first instance, and I want you to trust what I'm saying. And once you trust me, that's when you'll hire me. Okay. Think about the recruitment process. Think about the process. What, what is the interview all about? Well, you've been seen, you're brought into interview, people want to see if they like you, they want to get a sense of whether they can trust you before they're ever going to hire you. But you can fast forward this and do this both in the offline world and the online world before you ever get to interview. Uh, in the offline world, it's about networking, positioning yourself properly uh, in the right, uh, in the right uh, networking events, um, with the right connectors, people I call market makers, who can introduce you to employers in your target sector, and building a relationship with them so that they introduce you with an implicit recommendation. In the online world, I mentioned LinkedIn, one of the things you can do. LinkedIn affords you the opportunity to create uh, posts, status updates, um, publish posts, which what were um, the long form content. If you go onto my profile, uh, you'll see lots of uh, articles on there. Um, that's where you communicate your expertise. And what I do with all of my executive clients is I encourage them to write an article about something they know and understand, which speaks into their target audience. And that generally resonates with the target audience and gets them com into conversations that uh, oftentimes uh, yields uh, opportunity. So, um, you know, approaching an organization directly, it's the same thing, you know, same thing. Uh, this is back to the uh, the face-to-face -face world, which may start in the online world. So, um, you know, going direct to employer often starts in the uh, online world and then ends in the offline world in a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, but the hire cycle is important, and it's one of the frameworks that I talk about in the methodology that I've developed that uh, helps people to do things differently uh, and to understand how to do things differently to get different results. So I promise you a little example, because this is all very well, this is all theory you might think, um, but uh, if you know what you're doing, you can get different results and you can unlock opportunities or even create opportunities ahead of the market before anyone else even knows about them, before sometimes the employer even knows about them. And uh, the gentleman you can see on the screen, I'm going to tell a very, very quick story. You can read his recommendation on my LinkedIn profile. And by the way, if you're uh, listening to this, please feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my username is Simon, S-I-M-O-N-G-R-A-Y-A-C-A. -A -A. Um, let me know how you think this has gone, the webinar, if you've got any questions, um, and you'll see Jeff's recommendation on, uh, on there. And um, Jeff approached me. He'd been to job boards, he'd been to recruiters based in Washington, D.C., uh, he is a retired uh, Major General in the U.S. Air Force. Um, he was leaving the, uh, well, he's left the Air Force, and he wanted to get into the private sector. He wanted to go and work for a small, medium enterprise. And the recruiters had told him it was difficult, which it would be. Uh, it was a change in sector from public to private sector, change in size of organization from large to small. And any recruiter will tell you it's easier to move within sector, and it's easier to move within size of organization. Um, anyway, what we did... Jeff got very clear. Jeff started to understand the environment, his psychology, um, and he positioned his destination of travel. Uh, and he put a plan in place to approach a certain number of organizations with a message that wasn't about his need for a position. Um, he started a dialogue with an organization that wasn't about his need for a position. It was about a challenge or a problem they had. And he spoke into that, was invited in for a meeting, and that conversa conversation very quickly turned into a job opportunity. Uh, and that was a job opportunity in the hidden market. So it's absolutely possible. It happens all the time, but it only happens, happens for people in the know. So very quickly, so have, please have a think about your questions. We're going to jump into that very, very quickly. Uh, very, very shortly, I should say. It is later or early here, depending on your point of view. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about how I work in case this has resonated with you, in case you want to find out more. Uh, I run a program called Executive Edge Online. Um, it's for people looking to, to do exactly what I talked about today, to define, find, and secure the position they really want. Uh, it's an online program. Uh, it has uh, over 30 hours of content, uh, which goes into great detail on everything I've spoken about and a whole lot more. There is a fortnightly group coaching call uh, where you're on a webinar with me, uh, with other people in the program, uh, to ask your questions specific to your situation. 
because it's all very well having the knowledge, but once you go and apply the knowledge in the market, you're going to get feedback from the market. And this is where psychology is so important and having the opportunity uh, to ask questions on a fortnightly basis and to get an opinion and advice from uh, from someone uh, who's uh, who's gone around the houses with this and, and has done this for many, many, many years. There's also a private LinkedIn group that you're invited to join. Uh, it's on a subscription basis. You can uh, join, you can stay as long as you want. I generally advocate that people are in the program for at least three months, uh, but you can stay for a month, cancel any time. Um, I'm going to show you in a moment how you can uh, find out a little bit more about that and how you can, uh, can uh, get access to that to find out a little bit more. But of course, you've got the opportunity to email me uh, or find me on LinkedIn as well. So what does the content uh, what does the content include? Well, it's environment psychology, which feeds into planning, which helps you to define what you want and then process. Uh, some of the processes, um, uh, some of the find rather is planning as well uh, to find and secure. And then process is, is all of the things you would normally associate uh, with successful job search, but done in a completely different way. And uh, there's a bonus section. Uh, I've run uh, quite a few webinars um, with, uh, with experts in the States. Um, in fact, I think there's three of them in there. So you, you get access to all of that. Uh, and then there's the group coaching call archive. So even if you can't uh, turn up live to the session, uh, you can pitch your questions in advance. And I always answer those questions on the call. So if you'd like to, and I'm going to encourage all of you to do this, by the way. Um, I'm going to encourage all of you to do this. I'm going to encourage you to take the assessment to take the executive job search assessment that I've created and if you'd like to do this if you go to the uh, URL I don't think this is clickable on your screen but if you go to bit.ly forward slash talent marks if you go there you'll be asked a series of 10 questions once you've answered those 10 questions you'll receive a specific bespoke response if you like uh, which will uh, kind of gr not grade you is the wrong word but kind of give you um, an opinion as to how your executive job search uh, strategy stacks up um, and how it stacks up against the majority. And if you're not an executive, don't worry, um, because the methodology is, is the same. So uh, even if you're not at the executive level, even if you're just starting out, then uh, please have a, have a look at that. It will help you to think about things differently and reinforce some of the, uh, the content I've shared with you uh, on this call. So it's bit.ly forward slash talent marks and once you've completed the um, completed the assessment um, there will be an opportunity presented to you um, whether you take it or not it's entirely up to you an opportunity presented to you to join executive edge online uh, for the first month at a special rate so uh, you can trial it at a discounted rate uh, to see if it might be right for you so that's pretty much bang on time which is a, a surprise uh, normally I tend to run over um, but uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to pass back to uh, to Brian now uh, to uh, to take some questions. There's my contact details on the screen, email address, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, please connect to me um, on LinkedIn. Let me know what you thought of this uh, event. And there's the uh, the Bitly link to write down to go ahead and do that uh, that assessment. So Brian, hopefully you're here. Hopefully you can still hear me. Over to you for questions, please. Oh, out. Standing, Simon. That was just wonderful. Really appreciate it. Um, very smooth and disciplined approach, uh, reaffirming in terms of the strategy that people can and should take. So thank you very much. Uh, to, to lead off and to remind our audience, of course, to continue submitting questions so that way we can be sure to get them on and get them answered. To start off with, Simon, all right, so Folks are going to leave the webinar and they're going to wake up tomorrow morning and start their day. What are some top recommendations for simple next action that you would recommend? Okay. So the first thing I would advise people to do is to really start to question their beliefs about the job market at whatever level. Because, as I said on the webinar, psychology is the most important thing. Okay. What you believe will impact your thoughts and impact your actions. And that's not a static thing. That's over a period of time. And job search takes a period of time. At the senior level, it can take three to six months, sometimes longer. So I would, I would get people to start to ask themselves some questions. You know, what do I really believe about the job market? Do I believe it's a good place where there's a high probability of, of, of finding what I want? Uh, am I frustrated? Because if you're frustrated, you'll think that way. And you know, we don't tend to like to do stuff that we don't believe we're going to get a result from. 
Um, so if you think the market's a difficult place, your action is probably not going to be what it needs to be. So that's the first thing I'd encourage people to think about. Um, the other thing I think I would, well, the other thing I would encourage people to think about is, you know, what they really want. You know, have they ever, have you ever taken a step back to consider what you really want? Or have you in the past just reacted to what's out there? Um, have you fallen into jobs? Or have you actually decided what you want and then gone out and got that position? Because, you know, when I was talking about the hidden market, that is a very real place. I would say at least 50% of the opportunities, probably more, um, are uh, existing in the hidden market before they ever get to the job boards or recruiters. Some never make it there. A high proportion never make it there. So you have the opportunity to create and uncover positions, um, but it's about taking a very, very different approach, which starts with your psychology, starts with your beliefs. Wow. And, you know, I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody be so succinct and advocate so much for taking stock and even it sounds like a good next step might be to literally write out things you think you know or believe about the job search and job search process. Uh, absolutely, Brian. Uh, let me just let me just share this with you. We we are emotional creatures, aren't we? Okay. We 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 have evolved uh, over many years to to make split second decisions, to have split second perceptions about what it is we think is happening and how we're going to respond. Now, unless you stop and ask yourself questions like that, there's a whole host of other questions to ask yourself. Unless you stop and ask those questions and slow things down to bring your subconscious thought into your conscious thought through the act of writing this stuff down, you miss what this thing is really all about. Because the job market is really, as I said at the right at the start of my presentation, it really is a game of two people. You know, it's a game of, of, of two people. It's, it's whether two people will connect or not. And that means you understand, you need to understand your psychology and the psychology of the people you're trying to meet uh, or trying to get in front of who can potentially uh, bring you into their organizations. So, um, yeah, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to really, really think about this stuff because it's very, very important. It's the most important thing. Um, and when people say to me, well, Simon, what's the most important thing when it comes to job search? I say, well, it's psychology. You know, people, people contact me all the time through LinkedIn. They want me to look at their CV and raise me and I say, you're asking me the wrong question. You need to start by asking yourself a series of other questions um, if you're going to find success. Anyone could write a CV. Anyone could put a resume together. Anyone can put that into the market. But it's a low probability strategy. You know, I, I keep thinking, too, how that simple fact of how long typical job searches take is really overlooked or misunderstood or just really not totally taken to heart by job seekers that if you knew that a job search takes three to six months, let's say it takes three months, how would that fact or general statement affect how you go about your daily routines? And, and I mean, along the lines, like you said, the psychology, maybe it will give people some relief that you're not going to get a job tomorrow. Yeah. is more likely the case, right? So that way, yeah, relieve some stress. Look, it's normal to take longer. It takes time. Ab absolutely. But we live in a society, don't we, where we want instant results. We want to do everything faster, more instantaneous. But the job market is, is, is not that place. The job market, it could take between three and six months. In my book, Super Secrets of Successful Executive Job Search, in the introduction, I tell the story of an executive I work with uh, by the name of Clive. He agreed that I could share his story. It's a very powerful story. And, um, you know, he'd been on the job market for a year, about a year, I think a year and a half when I first met him. Now, can you imagine what his psychology was at that point in time? On day one of his job search, he'd have been very positive, probably taking lots of action. But on day 365 and then some, very, very different person. Very, very different person. On my YouTube channel, I think there's a video where I talk about Bill and Bob, essentially the same person but on different timelines in their, uh, in their job search. So you have to be prepared, prepared for the time it will take. And that's when your psychology has to be strong enough, your beliefs have to be strong enough to take consistent action over time. Uh, you know, one of the beliefs, while we're on this subject, one of the beliefs that people have is, well, I can't be out of work for three months. If I'm out of work for three months uh, and I haven't found a position, that's, that's, that's bad. That's a message to 
that's the wrong message to an employer. My question is why? It's more of an issue to you than to an employer. But what you'll probably do, if you believe that, you'll think that, and you'll take that in your action and in your messaging to an employer. Um, the other thing I get asked about all the time is, is age. You know, am I too old? Well, you know, no. It's a belief. If you believe it, it's going to impact your thoughts. It's going to impact your action. That's why psychology is absolutely everything um, when it comes to successful job search. I think that's such a powerful point because in in my own work with clients and experience through career development, career education, it, it's totally true. But when we're presented with it, we don't see it. It's just it's the oddest thing to experience. Where, like you said, what you believe is going to become your truth, and yet we might say, "Well, no, no, that's not true." But then the situation is still, and yet you might be highly stressed because you're believing, "I have to have a job now." Yeah. Oh yeah, and there's the realization, right? Exactly. Think think about how we how how we how we um, how we operate in the world, Brian. You know, we, we 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 look out into the world, we see what's going on around us, but we rarely look in the mirror and think about what's going on inside us yeah. and what that might, whether that's either helping or whether it's hurting us, because it will be doing one of two things, and that's not just in job search; that's in everything, absolutely everything. You know, it, I can't believe you said that because I was just, want, it's like we're on the same vibe. You, you, you brought me on to your wavelength. It's, it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> Thank um, you. So what, what you mentioned was, is what you're believing or doing helping or hindering? And the question I wanted to ask is, okay, so what is something somebody can do tactically like what are some actions to help working on those beliefs and and that's one example ask yourself all right if this is what i'm believing or doing how is it helping let's start with three reasons how is it hindering yeah let's start with three reasons what else would you suggest for people to keep working on the psychology side yeah okay great great question great question so i i get all of my clients this is my uh, private coaching clients and online clients i get them to keep a journal and I call this their thinking journal. And what this thinking journal is, it's a record of everything that they're doing in the job market to find a new position. So there is, um, a, a, it's not on the screen, but just to, to walk you through it very, very quickly, there's the date, there's the time of the activity, there's what the activity is, which is a record of what you're doing and at what times. That is important when it comes to building habits. But then more importantly, over to the right-hand side, there is a column, it's on an Excel spreadsheet, there's a column where they have to write down what it means to them. What their initial response to, you know, uh, let's say an in, they, get, they get a phone call, the interview's not gone their way. What's their initial response? And what we do together, um, either one-to-one -one on with private coaching or on the group coaching calls, you know, there's an opportunity to talk about some of that stuff and for me to ask questions. Well, okay, you responded in this way, but why? Why? Did that help you or did that hurt you? What could you do or what rules could you put in place to help you moving forward to alleviate that problem, to increase the probability over time of you finding and securing that position? And the, the, the planning section of the methodology that I've developed, uh, there, is, there is destination where you're headed, there is direction, specifically what you do and how you do it, and then there is uh, discipline. And discipline is about, is about the time you do stuff, the consistency of doing stuff, and it's about creating rules, having uncovered what's going on in your subconscious, brought it out to your conscious mind, you then create rules that you then follow that improves your performance over time. So the thinking journal, very, very powerful tool. And if you go to you know, my... You know, this, this is great because we... Sorry, Brian, we were... Yeah, we, we, we just got a question. Okay, go for it, yeah. We've got a bit of a time delay on the line, so I'm trying I'm... not to interrupt you. Um, perfect. Yeah, and I keep forgetting about the time delay too. And more than just the hours difference, but it's a few um, seconds. And you know, I, I kept wanting to say too. Clearly, Simon, you are far ahead of us, and you really are. So here's <laughs> here's what uh, came in as a question. Now it's very specific, but I think it totally applies and connects, especially to how do you, what it means in the thinking journal approach. And the question is from Nikki, and she wanted to know what advice you could offer when clearly faced with age discrimination. 
And I don't know what else the context is, but I was wondering if you could focus on connecting the thinking journal approach to beliefs, and let's assume that the apparent age discrimination is in the job search process, not in a current employment process. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of questions in there. You would, you would first of all see that cropping up in your thinking journal, because if you, let's say, approach an employer directly, you didn't hear back, the kind of narrative you would be talking to yourself in your head, your self-talk, which is what you capture in the thinking journal, would be, well, it's because I'm too old. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm too old for this organisation. Now, you might be right, you might be wrong. Who knows? You know, certain organisations, does age discrimination still exist? Well, you know, it shouldn't. But does it in reality? Probably, possibly. Uh, it depends on the organisation. But what I, when, when I'm asked this question by, um, usually by prospective clients, it's one of the first things they want, to, they want to tell me. You know, I ask them, well, why are you in your current situation? Well, it's because I'm too old. And I say, well, that's your belief. And if you think about that belief, is that an empowering or a disempowering belief? What about a different belief that says, well, the age I've got to, yeah, that has allowed me to garner and gather skills and experience that are of tremendous value to an employer. Now, I just have to position that in the right way to an employer to get their attention, not through the CV and resume, but by approaching them in a different way that speaks into their problems and, and challenges, problems and aspirations. That's what's going to get their attention. It's, the, it's your approach. And what I say to all of the, the, the people, anyone that asks me this question, I say to them this, um, that it's generally more of an issue for the job seeker than it is for the employer. It's generally more of an issue. So it comes back to looking internally and challenging some of your beliefs to then say, well, I can choose to believe that, that age is an asset or age is holding me back. If you choose that age is an asset, You'll think in a different way. You'll act in a different way. That will be communicated very strongly to an employer. Sure, some employers may not want to see you, may not want to interview you, may not hire you because of it. But not every employer will do that. And the vast majority of employers nowadays, um, this is you know this is not something that's really factored into their decisions. But it still could be, it still could be a reason because it's an inherent belief. It could be a reason that um, that uh, you're being held back, but that's an internal reason rather than an external issue. This is this is so deep and important because so much of job search goes beyond the mere tactics of applying, like the mechanics. Um, this goes into the, the real mindset, and I'm wondering if you would be able to connect for us two concepts that you had laid out earlier with what you just said. So mm -hmm. one that you talked about was the job market is a match between two people yeah. so that there's a relationship. And then your other, I think, crucial slide, which was see me, like me, trust me and hire me. Yeah. It seems like part of the answer to this person's question is, well, let's assume this alternative case. If an employer doesn't like you for who you are, see you for what you can contribute, et cetera, is that a good match? So yeah. is, how do you see these parts connecting to help empower job seekers? Yeah, well, to, 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 talk, about the, um, to talk about the hire cycle, um, you know, you are, through the hire cycle, you are developing a relationship with an employer that is not just about your skills and experience. In fact, it's about first understanding them, not you. Not positioning you, but about understanding them. Um, so if your conversation initially and your approach initially is about them, well, this would never come on the agenda anyway. You've built a relationship before you ever have a conversation about you as an individual. That might sound quite deep and quite complicated, but that's really what it's all about. There's something else that I talk about called the executive job seeker dichotomy, which means that one of the parts of that is in the, in the first engagement with any employer or recruiter. It's never about you. It's about, uh, it's about them. You're absolutely right, Brian. At the start of the webinar, I talked about this being a match between two people. Okay, a match between two people. It's not a match between skills and experience necessarily, because everyone else has a, has similar skills and experience who are who are going for a particular a particular position. If you think about how people connect, okay, they don't. You don't resonate with people. If you don't resonate with people based on logic. You know, we are emotional creatures. I've said this already. 
If you want to get somebody's attention, you know, you communicate to, to them on an emotional level. So think about what happens in the job market if people are simply relying on their CV and resume. That's logic. You know, okay, logically you should hire me because I've got skills and experience. Great. It doesn't tap into my emotions uh, as an employer. Far better to talk to me about a challenge or an opportunity um, that I could be facing in my organization. And then secondary to that, position your skills and experience into that, but not just your skills and experience, previous achievements, um, that uh, that's going to get my attention. So emotion, because it is connecting person to person, is so much more important than logic. And logic really is the CV, skills and experience. Emotion is about the approach I advocate. That develops a relationship. And this is where, in part, the higher cycle plays its part. Wow. This is amazing. You're like a practical existentialist in the job search strategy. <laughs> I've never been called that before, but I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The ability to really wonder about what is the meaning of something and how to approach it. It's, it's got a really great, deep philosophical approach, and then you're able to map it into the mechanics of it, where if you understand your your self and your approach into the situation and then put the other first. You know, actually, this all ties back to Aikido. I, I can see it now. I see your genius, Simon. <laughs> I see how it all circles together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A partnership. Uh, okay, so let's say um, after the session, our audience is like, all right, where do I start with some of your resources? What would be the top resources you'd recommend for our audience, which has a span of skill levels and situations, but you've got some great books. What yeah. would you recommend first? Well, the book, the, book is like the, um, the book is like the entry level. The book will give you uh, an overview of the framework. The blue book and the yellow book communicate the framework that I've talked about, environment, psychology, planning, and process. The green book on the left was written a couple of years back. That's more. That's when I was really coming, coming, coming together to form these four pillars. So either of those books will help. If you're not at the executive level, buy the blue book. If you're at starting out in, uh, sorry, let me say that again. If you are at the executive level, buy the blue book. But if you're mid-career, buy the blue book as well because you're aspiring to that level. If you're just starting out, I would recommend the yellow book. But that's like if you were at a restaurant, that's like the starter. Okay. If you want a quicker and better result, it's all about investment. The best way to do, the best way to work with me is through the online program. And if you do the um, if you do the job search assessment thing, uh, you'll be prompted and find out more about that. You can also find that on my website, careercodex.com. Um, but that's obviously, you know, there's a cost implication there. But if you want the fastest result, you work with me on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, so those are the three tiers of um, tiers of levels of how I uh, how I work with people. Generally, I normally advise people to go into the group coaching program uh, because it's generally more cost effective. And the group coaching calls on a fortnightly basis are of uh, tremendous value because you have the opportunity to do what we're doing now, but every fortnight. And uh, obviously, the stuff that I reserve purely for my uh, paying clients. So uh, that's what I'd recommend that you do. But uh, in any event, do the um, do the job search assessment. Uh, that'll give you some things to think about, and will prompt you if you want to take things a little bit further. Outstanding. And hey, audience. Be sure to take the self-assessment. You know, one thing that just keeps recurring, 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 know and understand yourself and where you're coming from. This assessment will help you get a baseline, a foundation. Another key payoff of taking the assessments is you expand your own language for how to talk about and understand yourself and your job search situation. Simon, thank you so much for sharing your insight and knowledge with us. We're at that time where we get to close and wrap it up and say thank you very much for sharing your experiences and philosophy with us tonight. I, I truly enjoyed our session, and we wish you well as you continue to carry your message that will transform lives and careers. And to our audience, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Your continued investment in your career will not only give you greater control over your career, but your personal happiness too. 
And we encourage you to stop back to the career community and watch on-demand lectures by authors who will share additional tips and strategy to help you advance your career. Until next time, good luck and best wishes on your great career.